Boldwood presents The Great Escape, written by Portia McIntosh and read by Karen Cass. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One How would you like fifty thousand pounds? I never expected to hear those words this evening. Who am I kidding? I never expected to hear those words ever. I always try to look on the bright side of life, searching high and low for the positive in every negative situation. My mum calls this the rosy outlook, an obvious pun combining my name, Rosie, and my ability to always try and find the good even when it seems impossible. For example, not beating around the bush, I hate my job. I realise that hate is a strong word and not the kind of chat you would usually expect to hear from someone who prides herself on being positive. But I do. I absolutely hate my job. When I was a kid, all I wanted was to be a detective. Not a police detective, though. A private detective. The kind you see in film noir. You know the sort. The cigarette-toting, low-key sexist, wise-cracking type in the long, plain coat with the fedora on top of the head. The only kind I saw on TV growing up. As I matured into my teens, and this no longer seemed like a viable job, if it even seemed like a real job at all, I realised that a job did exist that involved exposing the truth. I wanted to be an investigative journalist, and this actually seemed like a goal I could achieve. Flash forward to me, here today, 31 years old, and I am a journalist. Just not the kind I wanted to be. I work for the Salford News, just outside central Manchester. It's only a small local paper, though, so not only is there not much room for an investigative journalist, but every page of the weekly paper is pretty much an advert. I spend most of my days writing paid advertorials, which is basically an advert hiding inside a news article. And given that the clients are paying for exactly what they want these pieces to say, it's not exactly a challenge. I don't just hate my job. I resent it. I'm kind of trapped in it, until I can find something better. Well, trapped by my finances, at least. I'm technically a freelancer, so I'm not exactly bound by a contract. Unless I just want to stop paying my bills, but I've heard that doesn't go down very well. I did say there was a plus side, though, and that plus side is Sam, my boss. I hate my job, but I love my boss. Sam is my editor, and I can tell that she tries her best to give me the good jobs, and of the very few perks you get being a local faux journalist, she'll often toss a few my way. She's great when I need time off. She lets me off the hook when I arrive late. She even buys the office pizza on Fridays. Sam really is a wonderful boss. Money isn't great. I know it's not really great for anyone right now, is it? But I live within my means. My apartment is small, which means my rent is too, but at least it's close enough to work for me to walk. I just keep doing what I'm doing and hoping things will get better. I was a little down in the dumps today, because David, my boyfriend of four months, cancelled our plans this evening because he needs to work late. He's a lecturer at the university, teaching paleobiology. I didn't know what it was either. I wrote my dissertation on yellow journalism and the paparazzi. David gets more excited about things like mass extinction. We might not have much in common, but we still get on really well. Sometimes opposites just attract, don't they? So David was going to be teaching young adults studying for their master's degree all about macroevolution. I don't know what it is either. I just remember seeing his lesson plan over his shoulder and feeling like a bit of a dummy. Tonight, and I was going home to my tiny apartment to watch Hollyoaks. Or so I thought. I was just about to leave work after a particularly gruelling day writing an article about a local window cleaning company, when Sam called me into her office. 
She had two tickets for the live filming on a new TV quiz show, but it was her husband's birthday, so she wasn't going to go. She offered them to me and Gemma, the other girl who does the same job as I do. So, with nothing better planned, I made the short trip to Media City UK, the development in Salford where all the big TV studios are based. I didn't think anything of it when they told us we had to download an app so we could play along, nor did I expect anything eventful to happen to me when I found out contestants would be plucked from the studio audience. But then, I sat down, and as the filming started, I couldn't believe it when my phone started ringing. Mine! I had been selected at random to play the game. Gemma was fuming. She's not happy unless she's the centre of attention. I was just a combination of embarrassed and terrified. I've never been on TV before. Well, how many people have? but I'm not really the kind of person who likes to be the centre of attention, and I couldn't even begin to imagine how many eyes would be on me, and not just here in the studio. The show is called One Big Question. I'm guessing it's aiming itself at millennials because the app seems to be at the heart of it. It can be used by people to play along at home, but here, in the studio, it's what I can use to ask the public or the audience for help with answers. I can't actually believe my luck, but I'm on the final question, the titular one big question, and if I answer it correctly, I'll win the money I've banked so far. A whopping £50,000. I said, how would you like £50,000? Mike King, the host, asks again. I... I'd love... Fifty thousand pounds, I admit, my voice wobbling almost as much as I am on this tall chair. If I'd known I was going to be chosen to take part today, I probably would have turned the opportunity down, even with the knowledge that I could win some serious money. I don't think I would have thought I had it in me to get this far. I'm somehow too hot and too cold. I want to say the studio lights are hot but there's cool air con to offset the warmth. I am sitting opposite the host in the centre of a brightly lit circle in an otherwise dimly lit room. I can't see the audience. I can't even see the camera, not really. I only know they're there now because of the little red LED lights I keep spotting. Even without them, I don't think I'd be able to forget I was on TV. On live TV, no less. This is your final question, Mike explains. Who said blondes were dumb, huh? I smile politely. I have had to contend with the dumb blonde thing my entire life. First, when I was younger, when I had naturally blonde hair, and then more recently from all the highlights, because for some reason my hair gets darker as I get older. Your only remaining lifeline is to make a call from your speed dial numbers. Mike reminds me. When we started, I was allowed to select three numbers from my phone in the event of choosing the make a call option. Without many friends or people who I even believed would answer, I chose my dad Tim, Sam and David. I don't suppose any of them would know all that much about anything based in pop culture, but I think I have that covered myself. Anything on the life and works of Alan Titchmarsh, unscrupulous news practices or bones, and one of them might be some use to me. I doubt my boss would appreciate me calling her on her husband's birthday, so here's hoping for the Chelsea Flower Show or Cavemen. At least if it's the latter, David's lecture will be over and he'll be able to take the call. My dad probably won't even hear his phone ring. Ready for it? Mike asks. I nod, unconvincingly. OK, here we go. Which dinosaur had 15 horns? An impossibly big grin stretches all the way across my face. This has to be a joke. I might be optimistic, but I am under no illusions. I am not a lucky person. I don't get picked for TV shows. I don't have many people to call for help. 
and I definitely don't get questions that are going to be easy. And yet, here we are. You know this one? The host asks in disbelief. I know I might be blonde, but that doesn't mean I don't know anything about dinosaurs. I mean, I don't know anything about dinosaurs, but what gives him the right, huh? I know a man who does, I say, as my grin inches even wider. I'd like to call my boyfriend, please. Your boyfriend knows a lot about dinosaurs? I nod, only semi-smugly. I'm sorry to hear that, the host jokes. What's your boyfriend's name? What does he do? His name is David and he's a lecturer. What does he teach? Dinosaurs? Paleobiology, I reply. Is that dinosaurs? Yes. The audience laugh wildly. Mike is a sort of cheeky chappy host, a 30-something former musician who has somehow made it as a TV presenter. I suppose it's his charm. The audience clearly love him. OK, let's get Dinosaur Dave on the phone, Mike says. I wince as he says Dave. David hates being called Dave. So all you have to do is, when Dinosaur Dave answers, just tell him you have one big question to ask him. If he gets it right, you'll be 50k richer. Sounds good, I say. It doesn't just sound good. It sounds great. David knows everything there is to know about dinosaurs. There's no way he's getting this one wrong. I just hope he answers. Can you imagine if he didn't? Quiet in the studio, Mike says, hushing the audience as the phone rings. Hello, David says, when he answers the phone. Hey, David, it's Rosie, I say in a suspiciously formal manner. I, um, I have one big question I need to ask you. I try to hide the nerves in my voice, but it's impossible. I'm on TV, calling up my boyfriend on live TV to ask him a question about dinosaurs so that I can win £50,000. I cannot stress enough that this is not a typical day for me. Let me stop you there, he says, because I, I think I know what you're going to say. David, no, let me speak, he insists, as though he's talking to one of his students. For a while now, I have suspected you're far more serious about this relationship than I am, and I was happy to let it slide because no one was getting hurt, but... Now I suspect you're calling me to ask me to move in with you, perhaps. Maybe even marry you. You can be quite full on. Anyway, I just don't want you to make a fool of yourself. So the time has come. We need to break up. I didn't want to do this on the phone, but it's not you. It's absolutely not you. It's me. I'm just not that into you. And you're getting way too serious too quickly. I sit on my chair in stunned silence. The host is in silence. The audience is in silence. I imagine everyone watching at home is sitting in silence. If the cast of Gogglebox were watching this show, it would be one of the quietest episodes of Gogglebox ever. No one knows what to say or do. Rosie, say something, David prompts. I look over at Mike, who has his hand raised over his mouth. He looks shocked. He's cringing. But I can also see something hidden deep in his eyes that makes me think he knows this is TV gold. And he's just leaving things to see how they play out. So I do the only thing I can think of doing. Which dinosaur had 15 horns? I ask. The Cosmoceratops. I tap the button on the player dashboard in front of me. Cosmoceratops, final answer, I say blankly. I, um, Mike blusters. Cosmoceratops, I say again. I don't know if you can use willpower to stop yourself from blushing, 
but I am trying my hardest not to show how absolutely mortified I am. It's taking all my strength, and even more, not to burst into tears. Cosmoceratops, I insist, for a third time. Um, okay, Mike tries to push on. Is that the right answer? I have to endure one of those painfully long, uncomfortable pauses they do on quiz shows to build suspense while you wait to see if you've got the right answer. Every second is absolute agony as I try to keep a lid on my embarrassment. If this had happened under any other circumstances, I probably would have burst into tears. The screen flashes up that this is the right answer, as it has done with all the other questions. Only this time, as this is the final question, it is accompanied by a rainstorm of gold glitter. As it cascades down over me, Mike hands me a comically large cheque for £50,000. This feels like one of those nightmares where everything seems fine before events take a horrible turn, like you're giving your Oscars acceptance speech, but then you look down and realise you've forgotten to put on your dress. It is somehow one of the best and one of the worst days of my life. I can't even begin to figure out how I should be feeling right now. Sorry, he whispers into my ear, giving my shoulder a squeeze before turning back to the camera to finish the show for the evening. As he wishes the audience and the viewers goodbye, instructing them to tune in tomorrow for another live show, I look at my check. Of all the things I expected to happen today, the events of the last few hours were certainly not on that list. Chapter 2 Last night, I got dumped. Last night, I got dumped in front of an audience. Last night, I got dumped on live TV. However you look at it, it's bad, but the more you think about it, the worse it gets. I'm trying to use my rosy outlook to remind myself that I am £50,000 better off than I was yesterday, but even that is proving challenging today. I may be £50,000 richer, but I'm also one boyfriend poorer albeit one terrible boyfriend, who I'm better off without. I mean, come on, seriously. He thought I was trying to take our relationship to the next level, so he dumps me over the phone. And, I have to stress, I have shown no signs of wanting to level up our relationship. None at all. I've just been a good, normal girlfriend. I haven't expected much. I haven't stopped him going out with his friends. I've just given myself to him with blind optimism and he's tossed me away like an old dinosaur bone. Well, I don't suppose he'd throw an old bone away, would he? He'd salivate over it and write a book about it. I guess that one doesn't really work. He's thrown me away like, insert cool thing here, because David hates cool things. His mum brought him a snapback cap for his holidays and he threw that away. He hates avocados with a fiery passion, not because he doesn't like the taste, but because they're a hip thing to eat. And he always looks at my iPhone with all the disgust you'd give a dog turd. So, I guess he's thrown me away like any of those things instead. I sigh to myself. I really, really don't want to get out of bed. But I need to leave for work in 45 minutes. I know... I've just won 50k, but it's not exactly quit your job money, is it? At least, not overnight. I roll over in my small double bed and grab my phone from my bedside table. The stupid One Big Question app drained my battery last night, and by the time I got home and plugged it in, I was asleep before it had turned back on. I just wanted the day to be over with, and, to be honest, I didn't want to make any more phone calls anyway. My screen looks like a whole mess of stuff that I can't quite make sense of. So I grab my glasses. I don't need them for reading, so I don't usually wear them in bed. 
I generally wear contact lenses through the day because I think my glasses make me look dorky. But my eyes feel all funny, so I grab my glasses to wear for now. Does that say? No, it can't. Apparently, I have over 100 notifications. I don't think I've ever had 100 notifications on my phone, not even when I downloaded Tinder, especially when I downloaded Tinder. Missed calls, iMessages, emails, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they're all blowing up. I wonder if the one big question app has caused something to malfunction in my phone. Until I notice a notification for a suggested YouTube video called Woman Dumped on Live TV by Dinosaur Nerd. I click it, as though there might be some small chance that this isn't a video of me. But of course it is. And it's had over three million views so far. Oh boy. I click Twitter and see that my mentions and DMs have erupted with messages from strangers. I keep my DMs open for work, which I seriously regret right now. Some people feel sorry for me. Some find it all absolutely hilarious. And then there are the comments that are especially hard to take. The ones calling me a bunny boiler, laughing at me but in a mean-spirited way, saying David did right to dump me. No doubt from the idiotic incels of the internet who delight in seeing a young woman being made a fool of. As I get into the tweets where people start insulting the way I look, I realise there is only one thing for it. I need to deactivate my social media accounts. All of them. At least until all of this blows over. I toss my phone to one side and get out of bed. As if this situation wasn't bad enough, I just had to go viral, didn't I? And not just in the UK. Oh no, worldwide. Absolutely fantastic. I wander into the kitchen and put the kettle on. I take a mug from the cupboard and toss in a tea bag. I watch as the kettle boils, only to abandon it the second it does. What am I doing? Why am I carrying on like nothing has happened? My life is over. I'm humiliated. I wonder if 50k can buy me a new identity. I wonder what I can actually do with it. I could go on holiday. I could quit the job I hate, using the cash as a buffer while I find another one. It is such a soul-destroying gig. I'd love nothing more than to leave. I'm an adult, though, so I won't. I might call in sick today, but I need to make sure I keep going to work and acting like everything is fine. Things will catch up eventually, right? And at least I'll be around allies of sorts, rather than reliving my mortification. I grab my phone and call Sam. Rosie, oh my God, are you okay? She asks, answering after one ring. Oh, you know, I say as casually as I can, though of course she knows. Everyone knows. I'm just ringing to call in sick. I'm dying of embarrassment, hoping I'll feel better tomorrow. She laughs sympathetically. There aren't many bosses who would accept embarrassment as a legitimate reason for a sick day. I've been trying to call you, she says. Gemma wants to write a news piece about the local girl who works for the paper who went viral overnight. I didn't think it was a good idea, but the powers that be have signed off on it, so... Oh, OK, I say. Typical Gemma that backstabbing snake. I'll bet she's over the moon that this has happened to me. And in front of her, too. She was smiling like the cat that got the cream all the way home in the taxi last night. I guess I quit, then. You quit? Sam replies. Yeah. I quit. The words leave my lips so effortlessly, so softly, the tickle. It's one of the easiest things I have ever done. That's money for you. It makes everything easier. Anyone who insists that money doesn't bring happiness has obviously never been trapped in a dead-end job that sucks the life out of them. Well, I understand, 
she says, and I know you've just come into money, so I doubt I can say anything to change your mind. You know I'll give you a glowing reference, right? Thanks, I say. I suppose I haven't been happy for a while, and this money has just given me the push I needed. I thought all this was going to blow over, but... Meh. Nah. I'll make sure the article is sympathetic. It's the least I can do, she replies. I hang up the phone, wondering what I'm the most annoyed about. That Gemma is going to write this article about me, or that Gemma is getting to write articles. Real ones, not adverts, pretending to be articles. I'm about to discard my phone when it buzzes again. Since I deactivated my social media accounts, the barrage of notifications have stopped. Anything that comes through now can only be from people who have my number. And that's a pretty short list these days. When I see it's from David, I stare at my phone suspiciously as I wonder what he wants. With that obviously getting me nowhere, I give in and open the message. He wants to see me. He's asked me if I'll go over. Why does he want to see me? He can't be mad at me for not telling him we were live on TV when I called him because he didn't even give me the chance. Even if he was going to break up with me anyway, David is an introvert. He'd never want to do it on TV. He's not that hurtful. Perhaps he wants to apologise. I suppose I just gave him a scare, making him think I wanted to move in together or whatever. Hmm. I hurry on a tracksuit and pull my long blonde hair into a bun on the top of my head. I put on a little foundation, but that's it. Now that spring is starting to edge closer to summer, it's quite bright out on a morning, so I'll just hide behind my sunglasses. I want to keep things incognito anyway. I'll just low-key slink over to David's place, hear what he has to say for himself, and then work out what the hell I'm supposed to do with myself now that I'm internet famous and unemployed. I swear to God, this is how most people get into the porn business. I'm yet to receive an offer, as far as I can tell, but I'm not sure I'd accept anyway. My boobs are nowhere near big enough, my arse is covered in cellulite, and I don't even have a washing machine in my diddy apartment, so no chance of it breaking down. I'm about to head for the door when someone knocks on it. I instinctively drop behind my sofa. A pointless move, living in a first-floor apartment, but still. I'm terrified of who might be behind it. They knock again, but I remain in cover. I allow them a few minutes before slowly getting up and looking through the spy hole. Confident there is no one there, I open the door to leave. I'm about to step through the door when I stop myself just in time. There's a flower arrangement sitting on my doormat. I pick it up and take it into the kitchen. It's a beautiful bouquet, with white oriental lilies, creamy white chrysanthemums and baby pink roses. I remove the card to see who they're from. I love you. I should never have let you go. I want you back. Oh my gosh, it must be from David. This must be why he wants to see me. I grab the only vase I own, which is empty and just waiting to be used, but that's because no one ever buys me flowers, not because I'm super tidy or organised, and place my flowers in water before heading back into my bedroom to get changed. If David and I are getting back together, I don't want to be dressed like a shamed TV star hiding from the paparazzi. Even if I do kind of feel like one right now. Chapter 3 What kind of apartment do you expect a university lecturer to live in? Something stylish and studious? Books? Lots and lots of books, but neatly and sensibly organised? Browns and greens and maybe, just maybe, the occasional bit of red? I always imagined David's apartment being like that. A bit like Sherlock Holmes' office, I suppose. But David's apartment isn't like that at all. 
For starters, while he does have a lot of books, he has even more magazines. Piles and piles of them everywhere. On the coffee table, on the kitchen worktop. He's even using an especially tall pile as a table for his keys to live on by his front door. And then there's all the dinosaur junk. Not that I'd ever refer to it as that in front of him. I suppose it's good that he's passionate about his work, but it's two kinds of creepy in my opinion. It's creepy to have bits of real bones and replica skulls and whatnot lying around. But it's potentially even weirder that he has dinosaur toys all over the place. Yes, kids' toys, stationery. He's even just handed me a cup of tea in a dinosaur mug. I glanced down at it. It features a cartoon image of an especially sad-looking Diplodocus, his head hanging low with a little frown and heavy eyes, accompanied by the caption, All my friends are dead. I can't help but smile to myself. So, you wanted to talk, I say, getting the conversation going. If he wants me back, he's crazy if he thinks I'm going to give him an easy time of it. Well, how can I just take him back after what he put me through last night? I know that he didn't know we were live on TV and that I scared him with my choice of words, but he's going to have to show me that he's serious about me, that he made a mistake last night and that he's really sorry. Yes, he says, placing his own dinosaur mug on a coaster in front of him. His mug features a T-Rex along with the caption... T-Rex, which is about what I've come to expect from dinosaur mugs. They don't get much better than that. I know you never meant to embarrass me, I say, immediately kicking myself for making this easier for him. Of course I didn't, he replies. I would never do that to you. I'd never do that to anyone. I panicked when you said you had a big question for me. I thought you were trying to propose or something. Yeah. You said, I reply, trying to laugh that wild assumption off. It was too soon for us to even think about marriage. But the show is called One Big Question. And when you call someone to ask them this one big question, you have to say, I've got one big question. It makes sense now, he says with an awkward smile. How's the fallout? Nuclear? I reply. I've had to deactivate my social media accounts. People won't stop messaging me. Some of them are being actually really quite mean. Even I was shocked. And then there's the fact I quit my job. You quit your job? He says. His tone of voice would suggest that he doesn't think that was a smart move. I did. I hated it. And I'm too embarrassed to go in at the moment anyway. And now I have this money... I can use some of it to keep me going while I find myself a new job. I suppose I'll wait a few days for this gone viral business to calm down. I don't want job interviewers bringing it up, but then, yeah, I'm sure I'll find something. I'm hoping that's true. Not the smartest move, he replies, but I'm sure you've thought this through. It was more of a go-with-your-gut reaction, if I'm being honest. But even now, after I've had a little time to think about it and seen David's reaction to it, I still feel like it was the right thing to do. Of course I have, I reply. Don't worry, I don't expect you to start paying for everything. I mean, why would I? He says. We broke up. I look at him with a raised eyebrow. Rosie, I broke up with you... Last night, he says clearly, in a way you would speak if you were trying to explain something to someone who was completely delusional. You know that, right? Well, yes. You come over here, all dressed up, talking about me looking after you. Now you've quit your job. Whoa, that's not exactly true, I insist. And I'm here because you said you needed to talk to me. Yes, I want to talk to you about the money, he says, the prize money. OK, I think I deserve a share, potentially half of it. 
I laugh until I realise he's serious. Are you kidding me? You don't know what a cosmoceratops is, he says. I do, I reply confidently. It's a dinosaur with 15 horns. You didn't know until I told you, he clarifies, as though that might make me change my mind. David, are you joking? You humiliated me on TV. You don't think it was embarrassing for me? He replies. My students are calling me Dinosaur Dave. They've lost all respect for me. It's all over the uni intranet. Embarrassing for you? Embarrassing for you? I plonk my dinosaur mug down on his table without a coaster and pace in front of him angrily. If you hadn't been so quick to dump me... Well, that's the thing, he starts. I dumped you. Have you even stopped to think about why or are you too busy having a pity party and counting your money that you didn't earn? OK, wow, that's it, I say, grabbing my coat from the hook next to the door. Well, I'm not sharing the money with you and there's no way I'm taking you back. You can stick your flowers where the sun doesn't shine. What flowers? he asks. The flowers, the ones you sent me. I didn't send you any flowers. Of course he didn't. He dumped me on TV. He's not going to want me back. He just wants a share of the prize money. Well, he can think again. Ah, oh, I am so annoyed at myself for coming over. I'm not even sure what I ever saw in him now. I feel like girls are always willing to date guys, to give them time to come out of their shell, to see how things go, even if they're not quite working. And guys just cut and run. I pop my sunglasses on and storm out. I'm outraged at his request. Of course I am. But that's not really on my mind right now. The only thing going through my head right now is a question. If Dinosaur Dave didn't send those flowers, then who did? Chapter 4 It isn't a long train journey to my parents' house just outside Manchester, but it certainly feels like it is today. It doesn't matter how old you get in life. When the shit hits the fan, you can always go running home to your mummy and your daddy, with tears in your eyes and your tail between your legs, and no matter what you've done, they'll probably forgive you. I say probably because I'm sure there are some things even the most forgiving parents couldn't overlook. I'm not quite there yet. So here I am, with a packed bag and a racing mind, hurrying to their house to hide out. I can sleep in my childhood bedroom, even if they have turned it into an office, and watch TV with my dad. Help my mum peel potatoes. It will be just like Christmas but without the presence and with my life completely coming apart at the seams. I arrived home from David's place to a voicemail from Sam saying that the team from this morning had reached out to her in the hope of getting in touch with me. Apparently, they want me to go on the show and talk about what happened. As much as I'd love to meet Phil and Holly, I never ever want to be on TV again and I certainly don't want to relive the single most embarrassing moment of my life. It was that, combined with those bloody flowers sitting on my worktop, that drove me out of my own home. Without a name on the card, I am left wondering where they might have come from. Yes, I tried calling the florists, but as per the Data Protection Act, they can't tell me who sent them. I tried to explain my particular circumstances to the lady on the phone, but she wasn't very sympathetic to my cause. She mumbled something about bloody GDPR and how busy she was before hanging up, so that wasn't much use. Fortunately, because the card said, I want you back, that means it must have come from one of my ex-boyfriends. I say fortunately because I have only had, including David, five ex-boyfriends. The reason I am so puzzled, though, is because of these five boyfriends, I have been dumped four and a half times. We'll get to what constitutes a half-dumping in a minute. I know what you're probably thinking, because I'm thinking it too. 
If every single one of my boyfriends has dumped me, is it me who is the problem? Am I just so unlovable, or at least easily dumpable, to the point where all my relationships end in my tears? Kevin was my first real boyfriend. Well, as real as you can get when you're 14 years old. We met across a crowded, smoky food tech room in year nine. Some pranksters thought it might be funny to put a wooden spoon in the oven. And it was. At least it was at the time. Everything is funny when you're 14 and don't want to make scones. I look back at it now and just feel so, so sorry for the teacher. Anyone who teaches in a secondary school is a hero because I remember most of the kids being absolutely horrible. After that day, with the almost fire, we were split from our friendship pairings and made to work with a pupil of the opposite sex. I've never really been sure of the boy-girl system. How or why does it work? Seems like an archaic, sexist system to me that is heavily reliant on the two genders not being friends. Anyway, I wound up working with Kevin. He was my next-door neighbour, so we'd been all the way through school together, but I honestly don't think we'd ever said more than two words to each other up to that point, and it took us a while to have a proper conversation. At first we were both so shy and awkward, too scared to take the lead with our weekly cooking challenge. We'd edge around each other carefully, speaking as little to each other as possible, until one day... Our hands met over a slightly overcooked ham and pineapple pizza, and we just hit it off. We became friends, then boyfriend and girlfriend. We stayed together all the way through school, but I stayed at school to do my A-levels while Kevin went to college. Not exactly a long-distance relationship, but we were definitely moving in different directions. After Kevin, there was Eli, we had a reasonably brief relationship, lasting from towards the end of year 13 until not long after I started university. Eli worked at his dad's mechanic workshop in town, so when I went to study English at uni in Bangor, we were far enough apart for it to cause a strain on our short-lived relationship. There was no one else, not who I had anything serious with, until after university, when I met super-sexy Simon... I was doing an internship at a lifestyle magazine in Manchester where he was a photographer. He was forever going off to fancy places and snapping beautiful people. I always felt like I was punching above my weight with Simon. And it didn't help seeing models constantly buzzing around him like excitable little wasps, desperate for him to catch their good side. Let's just say that Simon and I had some trust issues. My last ex, before Dinosaur Dave, was Josh. I feel like I did a lot of growing with Josh. But then we started growing apart. Unlucky for me, Josh realised the relationship wasn't going to work within minutes of me realising the same, and it just so happened that he broke up with me before I could break up with him. Yes, I realise it's not a competition, but when every boyfriend you've ever had has broken up with you you start to worry that it's a thing. And now that David has dumped me too, I am petrified that it's a thing. There is a hint of good news in all of this, though. You don't have to be a detective or an investigative journalist to realise that, given what it said on the card that accompanied the flowers, while all of them may have dumped me, at least one of them regrets it. But which one? That's the question. It's definitely giving me pause, that's for sure. It's making me wonder, could my future be hiding somewhere in my past? My past is definitely my future today, as I walk up the driveway to my parents' front door. A beautiful suburban detached down a cute little cul-de-sac. I reach for the perfectly polished handle, but it's a waste of energy. My mum bursts through the door to greet me. Rosie, 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 she says. Oh, Rosie. Hello, Mum, I say as she squeezes the life out of me. Oh, Rosie. She starts crying. 
Are you crying because I'm home? Because I got dumped or because I was embarrassing on TV? I ask. I think it's all of them, she mumbles into my body. My mum is adorably petite. Sneaking in at just over five foot, she's small and skinny. I'm a bit more like my dad, who is broad-shouldered and towers over my mum at five foot ten. I'm five foot eight, so I dwarf my mum too. I'm starting to regret telling them the full extent of what happened when I called them earlier to say I was on my way over for a few nights. Thankfully, they missed it and can't work their TV to get it on demand. I'd rather they didn't see it. Hello, my dad says with a nod of acknowledgement. I wiggle free from my mum's grip to give him a hug. Oh, love. Mum, let's not talk about it, I insist. Tell me how you guys are doing. Oh, we're fine. We're just cleaning out the shed, she replies. Oh, God, I'm not sleeping in it, am I? Course not, my dad says. I'm making room for tomato plants. Fab, I reply. And you are helping, he adds. What? Did you think you could just hide in our living room, watching TV all day? I absolutely did, without a moment's hesitation. I even looked into what constitutes daytime TV now because it's changed so much since the last time I was knocking around during the day. I couldn't think of anything better. It sounds like they've got other plans for me, though. Outside, it doesn't look like they've been working on the shed for long, so I guess I've got my work cut out. Shifting tools, moving boxes of God knows what, sweeping, trying to ignore the spiders. I thought coming here was going to be a nice break. I was absolutely wrong. Chapter 5 After hours of dragging dusty boxes around, dodging creepy crawlies and listening to my dad's views on who should be the next Prime Minister, I finally find a moment to sneak into the kitchen for a breather and a glass of lemonade. I can't decide how right my parents were when they said that a bit of hard work was just what I needed right now, in my situation, as they're calling it. I sincerely don't think their reaction would have been different if I were a pregnant 14-year-old, like maybe they think I've got myself into this mess that has potentially ruined my life as I know it. Maybe I have. The hard graft in the shed is certainly keeping me busy, but my mind is all over the place. I'll forget about recent events for a moment, distracted by the discovery of potential antiques or magazines that, at a quick glance, looked like weird porn, but upon closer inspection are just really graphic angling magazines of my dad's. But despite the pictures of dead fish, my mind goes back to my life and, well, what I'm going to do with it. Rosie? My mum cries out. Rosie, where are you? I put down my lemonade and leg it outside. Convinced my mum's screams spell out disaster.